Welcome to the Irish Roots Cafe where every day is a holiday and every day there's room for one more. We're here with Elizabeth Healy, Healy again today and this is really our third interview but this is an amazing, uh, really it's an international type collection where people come from all over the world to, to investigate things and, and investigate their library holdings. Elizabeth, I'll let you take it from here. Why don't you introduce uh, this special collection which is running till uh, the end of July in 2016. Yeah, so we're here at the Kenneth Spencer Research Library on the University of Kansas campus. Um, and when most people think of Irish materials, I don't know that they usually think, oh, Lawrence, Kansas. Um, but actually, thanks to an amazing Irish collector named PSO Hegarty, we have really, truly world-class collections here. And because of that, um, in this sort of period of commemorations um, for Irish history, we thought we had to take advantage of uh, you know, the centenary of the Easter Rising to sort of display really the depth and breadth of our collections here. We have so much material on this subject um, that we really did want to do an exhibition that would provide sort of cultural and historical context for the Rising and then look at um, the aftermath of the Rising and uh, Irish independence. So um, this is an exhibition that will be up through the end of July and it's titled Easter 1916 Rebellion and Memory in Ireland. And how can people, if they cut, what are the hours for the exhibit? So our hours are Monday through Friday, uh, nine to five. Uh, we have Saturday hours during the semester, but we're actually just near the end of KU semester, so we won't be having Saturday hours over the summer, but nine to five, Monday through Friday. Okay, and is, a, is there a fee for admission? No, no, we are free and open to the public. And it's also true that um, if you see materials here that are really of interest to you, our reading room is open to the public as well. So you don't have to be associated with KU to use the research materials in our collections. Um, they're open to scholars from around the world. And we have scholars from around the world come and visit to use them. Um, scholars here on campus, students, the public, um, we're really uh, open for you because the materials here are rare and unique. We know that we want to make them available to the broadest possible uh, audience and so you just register at our front desk um, if you want to use materials in our reading room and then go into our reading room request the materials and we'll bring them to you at your at one of the desks there okay and this is the special library yes. if, if so they get lost do they ask for special archives. collections yes. yes yes so if you're trying to find us we are directly behind strong hall which is the main administrative building on campus we're between strong hall and the campanile which is sort of the bell tower Okay, yeah, if you look for that big bell tower, that helps. And there's always somebody on campus that can help you out. Yes. Now, do you want to show us a few things that sort of represent the type of holdings you have? Yeah, so I thought we could look at some of the cases um, and just get a sense of the variety of materials that we house here. Um, so in this case, um, this case is devoted to some of the other rebellions leading up to 1916. And so you'll see um, uh, an item that sort of is a later item, but looking at Emmett um, and the 1803, his 1803 rebellion. And then we also have, you know, Wolf Tone. Um, we have the question of, you know, union. Um, and then here we have some materials related to Charles Stuart Parnell and the attempt to gain home rule um, and uh, some measure of independence through constitutional means. And so here is a cartoon um, you'll see that appeared in United Ireland. Uh, and there's Aaron waving to her forces um, for the county convention. You sort of see a figure, it's Parnell, um, behind her with the harp in the background as well. And then um, a speech, and you can actually see P.S. So Hegarty, that collector I mentioned, his name, um, inscribed on the cover of this speech, sort of his uh, inscription, his notation that, you know, he has purchased this and collected it. Um, but this is a speech that Parnell delivered um, on the Government of Ireland bill uh, before uh, votes were to go on that bill. It did not pass. <laughs> so that was the yeah. first Home Rule bill, which did not pass. Um, and really, after that, there was sort of a long period of time where um, the constitutional attempt to gain home rule sort of went into <laughs> um, a sort of a dormant period for a while, um, especially with the scandals associated with Parnell. So if we walk over here, the next case looks at some of the cultural movements um, and political movements in the period sort of leading up to 1916. And so you'll see sort of 
Irish cultural movements like um, the interest in Irish language as represented by the Gaelic League. Um, here uh, we have an Irish language uh, sort of course book that Patrick Pierce, one of the leaders of the Easter Rising, um, produced um, to help teach the Irish language. Um, and then you also have um, overtly political materials like this, um, the newspaper Irish Freedom. And here on this particular issue, um, you'll see the stamp, and you can maybe barely see it <laughs> um, in the footage, but that purple stamp is of Tom Clark's um, tobacconist and sort of news shop. Um, Tom Clark, again, was one of the leaders of the Easter Rising and one of the men executed uh, after its failure. And so we have these sort of rich materials and things that often don't survive, like newspapers or pieces of ephemera, like this right here, which is a ticket for a meeting <laughs> for the Irish volunteers. It is from shortly after the founding of the Irish Volunteers, and you'll see that this particular meeting was in Cork. And one of the things that I find so interesting about these tickets is you'll actually see that stated on there, um, the capacity of the hall is 1,500, but this particular ticket is numbered 2,944. <laughs> so maybe they were, you know, hoping to disseminate as many tickets as possible, and then maybe only, you know, 1,500 would be able to get in. And you'll see um, that uh, Owen McNeil is uh, one of the speakers there, so who is uh, a leader of the Irish Volunteers. Yes, I think we sold some tickets like that for the Hibernians back in the 80s where we printed more tickets than we had just so everybody had one to sell if they could. Yes, and so this particular case looks at the Rising itself um, and it has some commemorative volumes that came out just after the wake of the Rising. So you'll see the leaders uh, here um, and then the damage uh, in Dublin, um, various figures who were either killed above or arrested um, in association with the Rising. And one thing that's particularly interesting that predates the Rising is this um, issue from April, 19, April 15th, 1916 of the Irish, oh, <laughs> Irish Volunteers. Um, which was a newspaper of the Irish Volunteers. And you'll see that in it there's a discussion of the Easter maneuvers um, and the plans for those. And the maneuvers were the guys under which um, Pierce and others who were associated with the Easter Rising were planning for this and that some people might know that the maneuvers actually meant um, that they were going to try this uprising, whereas many of the Irish volunteers wouldn't have necessarily known, um, and that that information would come sort of just beforehand. Um, and so you can see the discussion here. And famously, McNeil calls off the maneuvers um, right beforehand, cancels them, um, and those of the military council, the IRB military council, and those um, the planners and those who sign <laughs> um, the proclamation ultimately decide to move ahead even though um, they had lost many people who might have participated because of the countermand. Um, and, but they do decide to go ahead and they go ahead on Easter Monday instead of Easter proper. Even though it's the Easter Sunday is the date that most people rel relate to. Right, yes, so, so it was sort of postponed by a day, but they decided to move ahead, and that was after um, some a shipment of arms that were to supply the provincial volunteers had been intercepted, um, and after Roger Casement had been captured as well, and he was coming back um, from Germany to try and postpone uh, the Easter Rising. So in this case over here, many of the participants in the Easter Rising, and as well as um, many others who were just suspected of having participated in one way or another um, were interned in Frangach in Wales. Um, and this is an autograph book from that internment camp. And here this page is open to an inscription by Terence McSweeney. And you see that I, there's a poem as well. And McSweeney would later become Lord Mayor of Cork uh, after his friend, um, Thomas McCurtain, whose inscription you see a little bit above, if you can <laughs> sort of read the Irish script there, um, who had been Lord Mayor of Cork, uh, was killed um, during the Anglo-Irish War, so during the War of Independence. Um, then McSweeney becomes Lord Mayor of Cork and is arrested by the British for sedition um, and is then subsequently imprisoned and uh, 
Brixton prison and goes on hunger strike to protest his imprisonment and dies on a hunger strike. And so he's sort of known for that and he sort of became an international figure for that. But before that, um, he was interned in Frangok after 1916. And this is, is this is a book why they, uh, they all wrote why they were in prison. Uh, apparently they would hand it to each other. Or? Yeah, so um, it was not uncommon uh, at that time to sort of have these autograph books where people would write patriotic sentiments, they might write a poem, they might sign their name, they would often write their hut number or where they had lived um, before they were interned. Um, and so we also have uh, another internment camp autograph book from Ballet Kindler um, from during the Anglo-Irish War, which was another place that people were interned. And for those of you who are um, interested in literature, one of the rare items that we have um, is the, a copy of the privately printed edition of Yeats's poem, Easter 1916. Um, and Yeats famously wrote this sort of in the aftermath of the Easter Rising. And uh, only 25 copies of this were printed to be distributed um, by his friend Clement Shorter among their friends. Uh, and this was at a time when <laughs> Yeats didn't really feel like the poem was ready to go out into a broader public in the world. Feelings um, and emotions were so inflamed, politics were still very much uncertain. And so this circulated privately. And we have one of those copies. Um, and of course, the poem actually changes um, quite a well, not quite a bit, but there are significant uh, textual changes that take place between this version and the version that's later published in a book form in 1920. Another reason why these books are so important. You yes, can trace the yes. history and maybe the thought behind the changes. Exactly. Um, and so this sort of case is looking at the immediate aftermath of the Easter Rising. And then in one of our final cases over here, we look ahead to uh, the period following that um, to uh, the Anglo-Irish War, so the War of Independence, to the Irish Civil War, and to the time period after that. So you, what you're seeing right there is <laughs> a page from the printer's copy, uh, printer's proof copy of Sean O'Casey's The Plow and the Stars. Um, and so we have that here. Uh, as we come around, you'll see that autograph internment camp um, book, uh, this one from Bally Kindler. Um, and then uh, you'll see some political ephemera over here uh, from around 1917, 1918. Um, so the De Valera um, election poster, which features him in his Irish volunteer uniform, and it says, vote for De Valera, a felon of our land. Um, and you'll notice that the cartoon is actually done by Grace Plunkett, who was the widow of Joseph Mary Plunkett. Yes. Um, and then <laughs> uh, another item, actually the rhetoric in this one <laughs> sometimes reminds me of some of the politics that you see on nowadays. It says, look at the map, God made Ireland separate. And this is from um, the 1918 general election. Hey, who um, was Kelly? So Kelly actually was uh, a Sinn Féin candidate um, running in the St. Stephen's Green um, riding, and he was going against uh, a candidate of the Nationalist Party, um, and he actually was victorious. And so you'll see here um, some of the rhetoric that was in use following um, the Easter Rising, and this is where uh, you actually have in 1918 um, Sinn Féin win a number of seats, and then um, rather than taking their seats um, in Parliament in London and going to Westminster, uh, they decided to gather in Dublin instead, and that's how uh, Dial Aaron is founded. <laughs> okay, well, boy, that's pretty. Here, look here, let's see if we can get you on camera. Oh, there we are again. I've, I've been having to run, out, run around with this new experimental system I've got, Yeah. and we're going to have to work on the sound, but boy, I, I thought I'd stump you on who was Kelly, but no. You had just, uh, you had it all again. Where do you want to go next? Well, and I would just say, you know, in terms of the materials here, one of the things that we've hoped to do is to capture sort of the complexity of the politics um, and the sort of range of opinions that take place. And though there aren't necessarily very many unionist items in this particular exhibition, in part because um, O'Hegarty's collection, uh, its strength is not necessarily in unionist materials, um, we do have um, a memoir of uh, the 
wife of the person who was the head of posts um, at the GPO um, in Ireland at the time of the Easter Rising and her account of what that rising uh, was like from her perspective. And so that appears, um, oh, let's see, over here in this. Uh, I think she goes on the title page by Mrs. Norway, but her name was um, Mary Louisa Norway, and this was the Sinn Féin Rebellion, um, as I saw it. And actually, for those of you who are literature fans, her uh, son was actually became a well-known writer. His name was Neville Shute, um, and he wrote On the Beach and <laughs> some other novels uh, that you may know. Um, but I mentioned before P.S.O. Hegarty, and I want to point him out here, and you'll see him pictured there, uh, sort of in a picture blown up for the wall uh, in his library. And I'll talk about him a little bit more, but as I said, the reason that we were able to put on an exhibition in this depth of detail is that P.S.O. Hegarty's collections were so rich. KU first acquired in 1955 his Yeats collection um, and it arrived here just before P.S.O. Hegarty's death. And uh, then in 1959, KU acquired from P.S.O. Hegarty's widow, Wilhelmina, the remainder of his library uh, or the majority of the remainder of his library. And so it was imported from Ireland. Um, and so over 25,000 items now come from his collections. And actually, I will point out to you, he was a historian um, and a journalist and became um, the Secretary of Irish Posts in the Free State period and onward. Uh, and was very connected to a variety of political figures and was a member of the Supreme Council of the Irish Republican Brotherhood. Uh, and these two cases talk a little bit about P.S.O. Hegarty, um, some of his political connections, some of his political writings. Um, and then this case also represents him as a um, person of varied tastes. So not only was P.S.O. Hegarty, a collector of Irish history and Irish politics and Irish literature, um, but he was also interested in boys' novels, penny dreadfuls, um, French literature, um, modern literature. You see there um, Molière's play, <laughs> um, L'École des Maris, um, and that's actually the earliest edition of one of Molière's plays that we have in KU libraries, and it comes from the library of P.S.O. Hegarty. Uh -huh. Well, we're going to have to talk about him, aren't we? Yes. This is just a few more. Yes, and sources. actually over here is a letter. Um, I had mentioned that the first item that we acquired was P.S.O. Hegarty's uh, Yeats collection. And he was a great collector of Yeats. And this is a letter from Yeats's sister, Lolly, um, thanking P.S.O. Hegarty for a condolence letter that he had sent following Yeats's death. So. Great. Shall we, shall we go for the yes. uh, interview on uh, P.S.O. Haggerty? Yes, let's go sit down and talk a little bit about P.S.O. Haggerty. Shane Allegra Foil, a tafayal egeran, boin dar slow, hartain teran egoin, foevud veser, shan cheer our shin cheer fasta, niag her fainter on a faint.